let him walk into her. Just walk out. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit praise His name. Even death could not hold Him captive, even in the grave. He is Lord. in the grave He is Lord My soul My soul doth magnify the Lord And my spirit praise His name Even, even death could not hold Him captive Even in the grave Even in the grave, He is Lord. Oh, my soul, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit, and my spirit praise His name. Even, even death could not hold Him captive. Even in the grave, He is Lord. Even death could not hold Him captive. Even in the grave, He is Lord. Sweet. Hebrews 1 and verse 4 reads thus. Verse 4 says... Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has obtained is excellent than theirs. is more excellent. The name he has obtained is more excellent than theirs having become as much superior, this is the revised standard version, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has obtained is more excellent than theirs. I'm taking my time. I want us to hear and digest so let's, let's entitle this evening's talk, The Better One Continues. Because we're continuing the talk on what the Hebrew writer says about Jesus being the better one. God's provider of the greatest, the, the, the greatest deliverance known to man. God's provider of the greatest deliverance known to man is the man Christ Jesus. So in the book of Hebrews, the Bible describes him simply as the better one. The better one. Jesus, Yeshua, is God's greatest deliverance provider. The greatest deliverance provider. When Jesus revealed to his two, when Jesus 
revealed to his two disciples on the Emmaus Road in St. Luke 24 and verse 44. Luke 24 and verse 44. You'll notice that I'm being very, very timely. Very timely. As we wait to get the tech team to get this one up for us. Luke chapter 24 and verse 44 is one of the verses that we've read and have been reading over the last six months from time to time. It says, and he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, these are the words, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Everything was written about him. He is the better one. Amen. Jesus is simply the better one. Acts 2, 22 to 24 are two verses I want to pick out of that particular lengthy text to mention in this our session uh, Acts chapter 2 22 through to 24 and here's what it says verse 22 says Peter stood up after having said in 21 whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved he stood stood up boldly and he said you men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know verse 23 has something to tell us as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken, watch this now, by wicked hands, have crucified. You have, you have taken and by wicked, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Watch 24 now. Whom God hath raised up. Resurrection is key. Whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. When he said to the crowds on that day, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and said to the crowds that he whom you wicked men crucified, etc., it confirmed to us a thing that has solidified the argument by the writer of the book of Hebrews that among the most admired figures of the Bible, Jesus is just better. He's just better. He's better than Moses. He's better than the angels. He's just better. And I love to say something on that, you know, that Jesus is not just better. He is simply the best of all. Jesus is simply the best of, I don't know who I'm saying this for, but Jesus is simply the best of all. He is the one. In Luke 24, 44, which we've just read, you know, it was recorded. It's, 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 it was recorded there about the, the, the fact that he's the one of whom everyone spoke, David and Moses and all the others. But that's not all. For in Matthew 12, come on tech team, in Matthew 12 and verse 40, something was said there that I cannot afford to go along and allow us to, to gloss over. Matthew 12 and verse 40, where it said that in the same way, Jonah stayed in the whale's belly for days, for three days. So would Messiah Jesus stay in the belly of the earth. Let's read that. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, 
so shall the Son of Man be there, so shall he be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'm going somewhere with this. You stay, 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 stay tuned to this. We see further in the book of First Peter. First Peter 3. First Peter 3, 20 and 21. We see here further that in the same way, like in Noah's day, that he and his family got separated from the society of their day by water. In our time through water baptism, we get separated from the corruption that is in our world today as well. Can we read that? Watch this now. It says, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Eight souls were saved by water. Here, 21 now. The like figure we're unto, even baptism, does also now save us. I hear some people explaining all these things away. Yes, man. Let me tell you something. If you claim that you've gotten saved, if you claim that you're walking away from Satan and you're coming over on the Savior's side, you must get water baptized. You know, go back to verse 20. Man of God, you take me back to verse 20. Let me read to our hearing. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Look at verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not by the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's in a bracket, eh? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know what more we want. I don't know what more we need. Watch this now. If time would permit in this session, if time would permit us, we would go back to the Old Testament tabernacle stuff and see how they all parallel many things that got fulfilled in Yeshua Jesus and his church. All the things back then foreshadowed the cross of Jesus Christ in some way or another. Most, my friends, foreshadowed the cross. You had lambs being slaughtered. They were sacrificed at the altar, foreshadow foreshadowing the cross where Jesus, the Lamb of God, would die. You had the lava, where the priest washed before entering the holy place. And this can be seen as a type of baptismal washing. We also hear some scholars say that the tabernacle's table, the altar, altar of incense and candelabra, could be compared to the teachings, prayer, and communion practice that we carry out in our day, which is today in the church. You see, friends, as we read through chapters 3 and 4, as we read through chapters 3 and 4 of the book of Hebrews, an obvious parallel can be seen. We don't have the time to read through that tonight, but you should make a note and go do that before you go to your bed. A parallel between the deliverance of the time of both Moses and Joshua and that which our Lord and Master Jesus the Christ brought under the new covenant. There's a clear, let's go to chapter 3 of Hebrews. There's a clear parallel. Hebrews 3 and I'm going to read 2 and 5. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm going to be reading 2, 5 and I might touch on 6 and I might even touch on verse 14. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 2, it says, it says something quite interesting. It says that Jesus was faithful. And it says Moses was faithful. Here we go. 
who was faithful to him that appointed him. Let me read from verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Jesus was faithful to his father who appointed him. I don't know who I need to talk to about the importance of faithfulness. You are to seesaw. You are just this moment up, the other moment down. You are playing one lick and run out. But God isn't going to throw you aside. He's encouraging you through this message to become one of the faithfuls. So Jesus whom was appointed by, by God the Father was faithful. And also Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Can I take verse 6 because I want to make a point for thereafter. In verse 6, the Christ followers, that's us, the Christ followers, followers of our day are being encouraged to do a few major things. We are being encouraged to hold fast. We are being encouraged to remain hopeful and rejoicing. Can I read verse 6? But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we who are born again are, if we hold fast, the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. The confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. The confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. I want to say to someone who might be struggling spiritually, struggling in every area or, or other areas of your life, hold fast and hold firm. Hold fast. I'm encouraging you. I just want to take the time to encourage you to hold fast and to hold. I'm going back to chapter 2 because I want to make up. Oh, can I take verse 14? Let me take verse 14. It's important that I take verse 14. It says, for we are made partakers of Christ. You know I'm going to read that again. Eh? For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Don't give up yet. Don't throw in the towel yet. We are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Journey with me to chapter 2, 18 and 19. There's a reason why we need to hold fast the beginning of our confidence to the end. There is a reason why we need to hold fast the beginning of our confidence unto the end. I'm going to give you the reason. Chapter 2, 18 and 19. For in that he himself has suffered, in that he himself has suffered being tempted because he understands suffering because our Lord and Savior Jesus understands suffering only he is truly able to succor them that are tempted verse 19 is what I'm looking for now here we go verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 2 I've just read 18 and I'm just gonna go to now, is it 17 and, and 18 I'm to read? Come on. Let's get 17 and 18. Come on, let's go. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made. I'm sorry about 19. It's 17 and 18. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful. I'm sorry. How could I miss verse 17? A, a faithful, a, a merciful, a faithful a merciful, he, that he, he may be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered, being tempted, he is able. That's why our, our theme for this last 
I don't know when it will end because for, for a while to come, we're talking about the more than able God. We're talking about the more than able. Bible says because Jesus suffered and was tempted in all ways like we are being tempted today, he's able. He is able. Our Lord Jesus is able. Someone needs to hear me. Our Lord, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 10, 6 and 11. Our Lord Jesus is able. You all will remember that we read some weeks ago. Uh, uh, and pointed out how the Apostle Paul pointed something out to us. In 1 Corinthians 10, 6 and 11, we said, The things that I talk about from the tabernacle and from the old covenant, which is what Hebrews is doing, is comparing the fact that Jesus is better. Paul says the things were written for our example. All right? Now these things were our examples to the intent. We should not lust after evil things. As the people in the first church lusted after evil things. And he then says, he then says something in verse 7 that I'm going to go to before I go to, to 11. He says, neither be ye, be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to pray. Let's go to verse 11, which is the verse I want to touch on. It says, No, all these things happened unto them for examples. And they were, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world come. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's important that we remember what happened then but when you come over this side over this covenant the new covenant you must remember even more so that jesus suffered and we will suffer but jesus suffered so that when we are when we are found in a period of time when we are suffering that we can run to him and he can succor us is that amen he can succor us. Paul, my friends, is making the comparison here as well as those two verses are pointing out. Paul is saying then that just as we who are converts to Christ, just, in other words, in the same way that we are now converts to Christ, in the same way that we walk through water baptism, it is in the same way the children of Israel under Moses walked through water baptism. Paul says it was a type of baptism when they went through the Red Sea. We read that some weeks ago. Hear this. We did a song in church about two Sundays ago. And the song pictures it. The song pictures and points us back to a most horrifying experience that took place. A most horrifying thing that took place back there with them. On their journey, they ended... I'm talking about the children of Israel now. On their journey, they ended up at a place. Jesus suffered so that when we're suffering, he's able to succor us. The children of Israel end up at a place where they did not know what to do. Every single day, there's a born-again believer or a non-Christian who gets to a point on this journey of life where we ended up at a place, we end up at a place where we, not, we just don't know what to do. One lady was listening to us on, on radio on Tuesday night. She's all the way from um, um, Portland. Huh? She's from Portland, in the town of Portland. And she called me today. She says, Pastor, I can't tell you the dark place I was in. I was going under the enemy was just you know gonna take me out at, at best that's how she felt and she said she tuned into our program on love 101 tuesday night for 15 minutes and she she said she can't i can't thank you guys enough pastor for having delivered that message that just pulled me out hear me now on their journey they ended up at a place where they did not know what to do nor where to turn Moses, their leader, came under great pressure from the people, by the people, who turned to him in complete fear, in total fear. Here was their dilemma, my friends. Here was their dilemma. 
They had mountains on both sides of them. They had Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit of them. And if that was not enough, they had the Red Sea in front of them. What a predicament. What a predicament. All of us at some point find ourselves in some, some, some predicaments that are pretty close in resemblance to what I've just talked about. You see, I can't rush through this. This evening's talk is almost like a recap of some of what we've done before, but this is what God wants for someone who's listening, for someone who's watching. This is what God wants. So I can't rush this. I have to take my time right at this juncture. I must take my time. For you see, when they turned, when the children of Israel turned to Moses, when they turned to Moses and cried out and cussed and did all manner of things, Moses, the leader, turned to God. When Moses turned to God, some most, one of the most interesting things happened. God is about to speak to someone who's listening to this talk this evening. The people turned to Moses. They didn't know what to do. Moses only know, knew one thing to do. He turned to God. Moses turned to God. When you throw your hands in the air and don't know what to do, I'm telling you there's one last thing that you can do. Do what Moses did. But it is interesting. For Moses turned to God. When Moses turned to God... Oh, some most interesting things happen. I know I just say it. I'm saying it again. For God is about to speak clearly to somebody. He's about to, to speak clearly to someone right here, right now. He's about to speak to someone clearly right here, right now. Moses turned to God. God turned back to Moses and said, Moshe, you and the people just need to follow this one command. God said, my words now, read my lips. Two words, go forward. I wonder who that is for, for this evening. God says, I'm to come and I'm to tell you that you need to go forward. You just need to go forward. Somehow, somehow the devil is buffeting you. And things are happening on every front and every side. And God has sent me to tell you that all you need to do is to go forward. Jesus, Yeshua, who is the better than all the rest. He's the one who is better than all the rest. Is in this moment telling someone to just keep going forward. Amen. You think, no, I'm, I'm not going to rush it. I'm not even going to rush. Yes, you. Yes, I'm talking to you. God has sent me to tell you that you're waiting on a miracle. But the miracle is waiting on you. You have to first... Obey the command to keep going forward even before you see the miracle. Because it is as you continue to march forward. Lord Jesus, just march forward. As you continue to march forward, God's going to split that thing. God's going to open that way. Hey, God's going to make a way. So quickly the time passes by and we're at the end of another program. Thanks so much, friends, for listening. Come back with us next week, same time, same station. Do connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Praise Deliverance Ministry. For prayer or numbers to call are 876-435-3394, 876-630-8292. We thank you again for tuning in, and we hope that your lives are indeed transformed.